Thanks everybody for being here. My name is Elise Schabler and I work with Danielle Fitzko uh, with the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. So we are a collaborative between UVM Extension and Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Danielle and I both work for FPR um, and we're here to talk about Emerald Ash Borer. <laughs> and uh, this, this workshop is, is definitely more focused on the municipal planning side. So we're going to definitely talk a lot about the pest in general and the spread and the biology and all that jazz. But the bulk of the, the workshop part of this is really to help you guys start to wrap your heads around how your municipalities might go about um, developing a strategy for what to do about Emerald Ash Borer. So we'll start with the story of EAB. This is this is not life size. Um, uh, is it Rick? Back there? Yeah. You mentioned first detector. Is everyone yeah. familiar with the first detectors program? So the forest pest first detectors program is um, a kind of citizen engagement education program that we our program started in 2011, yeah. 2012. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So, and with the idea that we'd have um, a cohort of citizens statewide that would be like kind of the first line of defense um, in monitoring, surveying, and doing education around invasive. So, EAB was obviously a, a focus of that program. Um, also, Arnold Ashbor and Hemlock Willie Adelgid. Um, but it's nice when we hear someone identify themselves as a first detector. Um, we 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 have been doing planning with communities since then. So, for the last six years or so, we've really been trying to make towns aware that EAB is coming, make citizens aware, and I think for a while it was kind of like we were, um, you know, calling wolf a lot because all the other states around us were finding EAB and we were not. Um, so we were just reflecting on, Danielle and I were just at a national conference in California last week and um, I'm, you know, we're on the cusp right now in, in Vermont. This is all new to us, we're learning a lot, we're trying to make, make sure people are aware of what's coming and I was so eager to like talk to other state coordinators and partners across the country about EAB and everyone's like, meh, it's old news to us. <laughs> so, you know, the people in the Midwest, they've been dealing with this for 10 years now. So, um, so that's not to say that it's not to diminish the importance of Emerald Ash Borer um, and I, I think it's just to say that we have been trying to engage people for a long time on this and I think that there is a level of awareness um, baseline, but now it's time to really do the planning and the hard work and try to actually get some action around mitigating the impacts of the pest. So we'll start with the story of Emerald Ash Borer. This is um, the beetle itself, and I'm going to pass around. I have two vials. One is the adult and one is the larvae, um, just so you can see the actual size. It's very small, it's a very small pest. Um, it's about the size of a penny uh, in length. and um, it is deceptively attractive. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually a very beautiful beetle. Um, hails from northern China and Russia, and um, it kills all species of ash trees. That's kind of the, the basic information, is that um, this pest uh, feeds on ash, and it actually the damage is done when it's in its larval stage more than it's adult. So um, when the eggs are laid on the bark, in the summer and into the early fall, uh, the, the larvae burrow underneath the bark and they feed on that cambial layer right underneath the bark. So this is basically the vascular system of the tree. So um, what ends up killing the tree is once there's a critical mass of the pests in the tree, um, they it's essentially cuts off the circulatory system of the tree. So these feeding galleries are the telltale EAB sign and I brought a piece of wood that this is actually not the best example but you'll often hear um, talk of these s-shaped galleries so as the larvae moves through that cambial layer feeding and growing it's it's kind of swishing back and forth and making these galleries this is the general life cycle of of the pest so like i mentioned so the eggs are laid on the outside of the bark during the summer during the flight season which in vermont um, well, right now the federal flight season is May 1 to September 30th, but once, um, once we kind of hone in on what it looks like in Vermont and if the federal quarantine is deregulated, which Danielle will talk about, um, we might end up moving that back a little bit in Vermont because of our colder climate. So we, we're really not anticipating that we'll see um, May 1 as being the, the, the earliest flight season. For, it's probably going to be June. Um, anyway, so eggs are laid on the bark. 
and the larvae burrows underneath and for one to two winters. So sometimes it's just one feeding season, sometimes um, they're, they feed for two whole over winter twice. Um, and as they're growing, they're doing that damage, they're feeding on that cambial layer, and then they emerge as adults through a D-shaped hole. Um, and so this is the other piece. And, and if you have, have heard about EAB in the past, this is something that we, we used to tell people, look for the D-shaped holes in the tree, and you'll see it's extremely small, <laughs> very small exit hole. Um, but it is flat on one side. So that's, that is once we kind of hone in on an infestation, that's one telltale that that tree um, likely has an infestation. And the other thing to note is just that at the early infestation levels, the pests will be in the canopy. So the D-shaped holes are particularly hard to see because it's very high <laughs> up high. So unless you have super binoculars and a really keen eye, you might not actually see that hole. Um, and then once they emerge as adults, they feed on their, um, their marginal leaf eaters. So they'll feed, the adults will feed on the leaves of the trees before, you know, doing the next um, life cycle again. So that's the, the general life cycle of, of the pests. And just I think the important thing to note is that, again, that damage is being done by the larval stage of the pests and not by the actual adult stage. Um, what age trees will from small to large? So they will, uh, they have been found to feed on, on anything from one inch in diameter and above. So that means saplings. They're, they, they are not discriminating. It doesn't need to be a mature tree. Um, they, they will feed on whatever will, will sustain them. So um, unfortunately, that's, there, was, there was a thought um, at the when, when EAB first came on the scene in 2002, in the Detroit area, we uh, there was hope that um, you could essentially starve out the pest by getting rid of its food source, so taking out all the ash trees, um, or thinking that once all, they kill all the ash trees in an area, it'll leave that area and move out. But because it um, does not really discriminate on age, and it's it will anything that's being reproducing, it's still eating that. Um, so we haven't seen it move out completely of any area so far. Um, so in Vermont, um, so I mentioned it feeds on all species of ash. I will mention that it, it also has been found to feed on a fringe tree, which is Chinananthus. Um, we don't really, it's an ornamental tree in Vermont. We don't see a lot of fringe, white fringe trees, so we don't generally, you know, mention it too much, not worried about it too much. There might be some specimen species throughout the state, but um, that's more of a concern for kind of mid-Atlantic states that have that as more of a prevalent tree and it's just not cold hardy. So um, for us, it's ash. So in Vermont, that's white, green, and black ash. Um, and this is just a general distribution of um, ash across the country. And this is on density. Yeah. Yes, so darker green, higher. <laughs> darker green, higher density of ash. Um, and um, in Vermont, we know that it's about, ash makes up about 5 to 7% of our, of our forested woodlands. Um, and we think that's about 160 million trees. But in our urban areas, which is what we're more focused on as, as an urban community forestry program, uh, we really see it varying. So uh, we have been doing street tree inventories with towns pretty extensively for another project that we did full street tree inventories and we were able to pull out the ash data from those. Um, we've done about 30 towns, so we know you could have anywhere from 15 ash trees on your public property, like Barry City, we only, they only have 15 on, in their public right-of-ways. Um, up to downtown Stowe, 50% of their street trees are ash. So it really is varying from town to town what your vulnerability is within the public realm. Um, we know that you know, Burlington, about 11% of their trees, so about 1,200 of their street trees are ash. Um, and, and it is just historically interesting, you know, most towns in, the, in New England uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s lost all of their elms to Dutch elm disease. And uh, green ash was particularly one of the prevalent species that was replanted after elm. Um, Kind of we lost all of our elms and it's a it's a species that um, does really well in the urban environment it's very tolerant of different growing conditions and salt and it grows pretty fast and it's aesthetically pleasing so it is a species that um, 
you know, I think in Vermont, even, even with Stowe being, having 78 trees to deal with, we're hearing stories of uh, towns in Ohio and in Minnesota and in Iowa that are 75% of their trees are green ash. So um, I think there's good perspective to think about, you know, we're going to be dealing with town by town, different situations, but um, there are places in the Midwest where essentially they're, entire, they're, they're losing their whole population again, just like, so there's a lesson here. <laughs> Don't plant monocultures. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking about yeah. um, some neighborhoods that we'll see like in South Burlington and yeah. Williston when neighborhoods were being built, it was just like the Vogue tree and it was like copy paste, copy paste, and there are 100% ash. 100%, so, yeah. so you know, that, those neighborhoods would really be affected. Right. So spatially, there's differences too. Yeah, yeah. What actually kills the tree? Is it the bark being compromised the, so, or the leaves? Well, so this, like I mentioned, the entire vascular, the exchange of water and nutrients yeah. is cut off. So the okay. roots aren't able, the, the, the nutrients that are produced by photosynthesis aren't able to go down to the roots and the water that's absorbed by the roots is not able to go. So the entire, their whole pro the whole process of creating its own food is disrupted. So, um, but you'll see that first through the, the, the outer branches will start to die back um, first and then, and then the bark, you'll see the bark cracking and um, there's a whole process of signs and symptoms. Um, but it's, it's a pretty quick turnaround. So most trees, um, once they are infested within five years, they will succumb. Um, and the kicker there is that it could be three years before you even know the tree has EAB. So there's a pretty quick turnaround between when the tree goes from looking like it might be okay to being a dead tree on the side of the road. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's another reason it's important to start thinking about monitoring efforts in your town and engaging residents and first detectors and uh, making sure people are, are aware of where the infested area is and where um, where those new infestations are being detected so you know how close <coughs> the pest is and where and where it is right now in Vermont. Um, these two, the Hartford and Randolph numbers uh, are not down, these are all street tree inventories but these are towns that um, have done more of a town-wide roadside ash inventory. So those higher numbers are estimate, estimates on the total number of rural roadside trees. And so this is you know, something we'll talk about tonight, but I think by and large, um, we're kind of considering that rural roadside a wild west situation because there's a lot of good information from the other states on how EEB has been moving through cities and how um, you know, residential, rural, or residential and suburban areas um, are dealing with EAB and strategies to manage for the pest. Um, but with ta in talking with other states, there really hasn't been a lot of attention paid to the rural roadside. And in Vermont, we all know that's a lot of what we're talking about at the town level. And we know that there are a lot of towns that have a lot of ash along their rural roads. We also know that um, most towns don't have a budget for trees now, and um, and when when you start to think about that vulnerability and the impact that EAB might have, um, the cost, the projection of the cost of that over time is is going to be a pretty staggering for a lot of people to wrap their heads around. So. Um, you know, we know that a lot of towns might just assume that their road crews will just deal with the trees as they're dying along the right of way. And that's something that we're really, Jim mentioned when you walked in, um, the trees are dying fast. And uh, the way that they're dying, it's, they, they fall apart pretty quickly. So it's a kind of a different beast. Um, they're not like an elm tree that can stand dead mm -hmm. for a couple of years. Um, the way that the ash fall, fall apart, um, they're just, I think it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require some training and some understanding that they're um, a little bit more dangerous than, than your normal just roadside elm tree. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so um, this is a, a so what the, some of the, the experience, some of the, one of the good things about being kind of late to the game and <laughs> getting EAB is that you know, we are able to learn a lot from what other states have learned. Um, we're the 
30, there's 35 states now that have EAB, so we are really on that tail end. And um, this is kind of a graph that shows the, the way that the pest, the, like the invasion wave comes through. So right now in Vermont, we're really at the cusp. So we're, we're, not, we're seeing really low density of EAB. And it's not until maybe year eight or so of an infestation that you really see those population spikes. Um, and that's what this is up here. And then following kind of right behind that, then you start to see those mass die-offs of the ash trees. So we've had people call in to our office or the state entomologist's office asking for where can we go to see what it looks like in a highly infested area in Vermont. And we say, we don't have that yet. <laughs> we, it's, it's really hard to see um, these infested sites. So um, the first infestation in Orange and Caledonia uh, and Washington counties, um, that was a consulting forester found that those trees, he was a trained eye, and he um, happened to come across trees on private property. The trees in Montpelier are actually that are infested are actually at the State Agency of Natural Resources office, and our state forest health lead happened to park underneath one of them and looked up and was like, huh. So it's... <laughs> I drove by it for three years and it's really did hard not to know. See. Still would not guess. Um, the, the infestation in Stamford down here, the actual pest was found on a purple trap. So it was, it was not actually a tree that was flagged. It was found on a trap. And we have yet to find a tree that we know is infested. So we know it's here. We just, you can't say, go look over in that park. You'll see a bunch of trees, and that's pro those are probably infested. I notice on the uh, Vermont Invasives map, or I don't know whose map it is, but anyway, the, the Stanford uh, fried egg yes. is now <laughs> got two centers. Yes. And yes. so it has been found it's in another. Two traps. Two traps. Oh, they're both traps? Yeah, they're traps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so this is all just to say, again, we are, we're here right now. We're at year one. Um, so we're going to start, we have time. So, yes. Uh, yes, so, so as far as we know, right. So, and I think that's also understanding that, like, in this year one, we found three very disparate locations of where the pest is. So it has likely been here for a number of years. Um, but we're still not the, in this place where we're actually seeing high levels of high density of, po of the populations. So this is just to say, there is time to plan. Like, and this is the time to plan. This is right now, we're, we're here at this early end, um, and that's a message just to take back that we're gonna, you're gonna see this die off. We're gonna see the population spike. Um, right now is the time to have a plan in place for what's, how you're gonna approach that. Um, and I just wanted to mention this, um, has anyone heard of li lingering ash? So these are the trees that, um, from the research in the Midwest, these are the trees that are exhibiting some tolerance to emerald ash borers. So there is this kind of continu continuum where we're seeing about 99% of ash trees are susceptible to EAB. It has no natural, natural predators here. Our ash trees are not adapted to deal with EAB the way that the native um, Asian ash are. But there are um, trees that are being identified that are tolerant and very rarely resistant to the pest. And so what that means is that the trees, um, in a variety of different ways that I'm not going to get into, um, basically either kill the larvae um, or kill the adults um, through their own reactions. So they are very rare. In the plots in the Midwest, um, it's between 0.1 and 1% of all the trees. Um, but there are already crossbreeding programs in place. So we have learned from chestnut. We have learned from the elm. We have, there are processes now in place that they know the best ways to go about those breeding programs so that they're breeding resistant, more resistant and tolerant ash to replace all of them that will die from, from EAB. Um, and I just mentioned this because um, we don't want to come across as, as just saying we need to cut down all of the trees. And I think for um, areas of wooded, wooded areas that do not pose a public safety hazard or risk to public or property, public safety or property, 
um, by and large, you can leave those trees standing. That is not to say that some people don't want to harvest their ash and try to sell the lumber um, or harvest for firewood or, or whatnot, or maybe have some other reasons that they just don't want to have those dead trees standing. But um, if you cut them all down, we don't know if they're tolerant or resistant. So um, if, if you are talking to landowners, that it's, it's not, you don't have to go cut down on your trees. There, some of them might be tolerant and resistant. So I just mentioned that certainly within the public right of way, um, we're, we do not promote leaving trees to die um, because 99.9% .9 of them are going to die if they're not treated. So you really have to be thinking about public safety and um, the, the duty of a municipality to manage the right of way and the public places. I'm going to let Danny talk a little bit about slowing the spread. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to share with you our efforts at a state level to slow the spread of, of emerald ash borer. So basically slowing the, the death of ash trees across the state. Because we really, we have time. We want to, uh, there's time for more research to come out. So we have hope that there'll be more breeding programs and biological control. So our effort is to slow the movement of EAB across the state. Uh, so, as Elise mentioned, it was first detected in 2002 in Detroit. Uh, the red dots are basically where it was first detected in counties. And so if it was spread, first detected in 2002 in Detroit, it naturally flies about one to two miles per year, naturally. And yet, we have it all across, we're in Vermont, it's in Maine. It's, it's traveling pretty far, pretty fast. Um, and we know that's pretty much happening because humans are moving it. Uh, and they're moving it through mainly firewood, but wood products. So now it is established in 35 states. We were the 32nd state. This year seemed to be popping up all over New England because Maine and Rhode Island came on board as well. And New Hampshire found a few more counties pop up as well. Um, it is a federally regulated pest right now. And that means that APHIS, Agency of Plant Health Inspection Service. It's the uh, federal regulatory agency. Uh, and they will put quarantines around managing for the pest. And so there is actually a public comment period right now to deregulate emerald ash borer. And that is because they've been trying to regulate it for a very long time, since 2002, and they've been unsuccessful. And so they would like to shift the resources from enforcing a quarantine to more research and outreach around the pest. And there are a lot of other invasive pests now that are sort of on the horizon that they'll probably focus more of their effort on. So uh, we did put out a, uh, some information out last week, and I can connect you to our, our listserv on it, is that if you, have, uh, you want to share some thoughts on that, the comment period is open now. Um, as I mentioned, this is a pretty um, good way for EAB to get around pretty fast at 60 miles an hour in the back of a pickup truck. And what you'll find is a dead tree in your backyard. I'm going to my camp. I'm going camping out of state. Let's take down the dead tree. And we move it pretty fast. Um, the infestation we just found in South Hero was at a, a private campground. So we know we've been searching campgrounds for a while. Uh, but firewood movement is a key carrier of EAB. Uh, oh, this is an example from our friend uh, in, in New York. And he was, where was he at? This was in Salem, Massachusetts, before that county had EAB. So this pile of wood is right outside a wood-burning pizza place, right? So, he, so he's an uh, urban forester from Ithaca, uh, knows a lot about EAB. So he's like, I'm going to check out this wood pile. And lo and behold, we think this was heat treated, <laughs> but just it just travels, and you wouldn't even think about going to like a pizza place to be thinking about uh, EAB movement. So uh, it it's just what happens, um, and it's unfortunate. There's now firewood regulations, um, and we're really trying to put the rec recommendations out to slow the spread. Um, so. This is the story of EAB in Vermont. It was first confirmed in February of this year, and it was found in Orange County, um, in the town of Orange, as Elise mentioned by a consulting forester. 
Uh, now we have it in Barrytown, Groton, Montpelier, Orange, Plainfield, South Hero, and, and Stanford. Uh, so honestly, we've been at this for a while looking for the past, and we kept saying, why can't we find it? And like, one of the key indicators that you have EAB is woodpecker activity because they're looking, you know, they're feeding on the larva, so you get this, like, what we call blonding, some blonding of the bark. And we kept saying, do we have lazy woodpeckers? Like, what's going on? We're, like, <laughs> surrounded. And then all of a sudden we found it, and now, like, the state is, like, it's, like, popping up all over the place. And we was like, oh, no, and, then, and they're dispersed, and so we're kind of, like, now we're really dealing with it. Uh, so, so the way our map, we decided to go, <coughs> is my, I just want to see something. Uh, did I put the statewide quarantine? Must be next. Uh, so we decided to go with a statewide quarantine uh, and put our efforts into slowing the spread from where we know EAB is. Um, so what you're looking at, the, the red and orange with the green outline, is what we're, we are calling the infested areas. The red zone is what we're calling the confirmed infested area. So basically, we know we have a tree, a trap, a, a site that we know EAB has been found. And then we go five miles out from that site because we know at low populations it's very hard to detect. So we expect it to be within five miles of that found site, that, that tree or that trap. Then we have a five mile buffer from there, which we're considering the high risk area because we know that EB is expected to be there within a few years. So those areas combined, we're calling the infested area. And we're using those areas as uh, what we'd call to slow the spread of EAB. So does that make sense? I'll, I'll share with you what slowing the spread looks like. But does the confirmed areas make sense? So it's a ten, pretty much a 10 mile uh, radius around where we know we have found EAB. Okay, so Vermont's approach is uh, we have a whole series of partners. So who's VT Invasives behind the scenes? We're working with the Agency of Ag, uh, Forest Parks and Recreation, certainly working with the Forest Service. APHIS are the federal regulators, and UVM Extension are the partners behind the scenes, uh, pulling up all the fact sheets, the, the, the maps. Uh, and we went with this, and I shared before, we went with the statewide quarantine. Um, the, our other option was to go with a county, a county quarantine, but we, we knew the feds were going to probably throw up the quarantine, and we wanted to put our efforts into slowing the spread within the areas that we know are infested, um, and decided that we would focus on education and outreach. So let me, let me share with you what slow the spread means. And so it's basically, we know we're considering those areas that are, are, are in the infested areas, considering that, okay, that would potentially could have EAB. And we don't want it to leave from an infested area to a non-infested area, because we don't want to spread the beetle. So we're, rec we're saying if it's in the infested area, you should not move it out of the infested area unless, it's, unless you're treating it in some way. Because we don't want to spread to a new uninfested area. So we have recommended practices, which are in your packet. Um, and it's also based on uh, time of year. And I'll, I'll share that a little bit too. Uh, there is one catch here. Uh, these are recommendations, but there is a statute under Agency of Ag that says you cannot move a, a plant pest. Uh, so EAB would be considered a plant pest. So if it's visibly infested, and you move it from the infested area outside of it and do not follow these recommendations, ag does have the ability to, to, to enforce that. We don't know what that looks like, but there is some teeth that they could come in there and enforce moving EAB from an infested area outside of it without following our recommendations. Does that make sense? Okay. So these are just some examples of slowing the spread if you were doing tree clearing or cutting. Um, you want to consider the timing of your activities. As Elise mentioned, there's the flight season, which is May 1 to September 30th. That's when the adult is out and about. That's basically the riskiest time. You're moving firewood, say, in May to your place, to your camp in August, 
and all of a sudden the adult now emerges and can infest new areas. So the safe time to move is the non-flight season, which would be October 1 to April 30th, because the it's in the, it's in the bark, it's in the wood, and it's not out moving around. So a lot of our practices, if you are saying harvesting, you want to move it to a processing place, you just want to make sure that it's processed and treated by uh, May 1st. Or because, burnt. burned. Or burned. Not just left in the pile. Yeah. <laughs> you want to make sure it's done by May 1st because that's when the flight season starts. Um, we actually think it's more like mid-June in Vermont and probably ends uh, early September, but we're saying May 1 till September 30th. Uh, chipping or mulching is considered a treatment because you're taking it down to a size that does not have enough wood for the larvae to feed. So a uh, lot of arborists and utility companies will chip the trees. And so if it's chipped or ground, you can now move it outside of the infested area because it's considered treated. And that pest cannot, the larvae cannot survive that and will die off. So you're not spreading it. Um, we like to say keep it local, so if you don't have to move it out of the infested area, particularly with firewood, you'd want to keep it local and not move it out. You can use it, move it within the infested area. Um, EAB can live at least a year in uh, a piece of firewood, if not longer, so the, the risk is lasts for a while. Um, and you can protect high value trees, and at least we'll get into this a little bit more. Um, but there is treatment options available, um, particularly, you know, some high value trees, but it, she'll talk about it. It's a long-term commitment. And now I'm passing it back. Okay. Good. All right, so we're good on time, I think. Um, so we gave you a packet, and I'm not gonna like nitpick through all of this, but this is for you to take home, and this is all this, all the stuff in your packet is available on our website, but one of those documents is a worksheet, it's a municipal planning worksheet. So this is not step by step, but most of this information is just reiterating what's in that worksheet. Um, the three just kind of main points I want to make about municipal planning for Emily Ash Borer is that um, for a lot of towns, ash, ple ash, please, ash trees do play a pretty important role um, in, our, in our street tree populations, our downtown trees, and particularly um, we're seeing on the in the within the right of way on rural roads. So um, it's important just to recognize that trees do have value. I mean, we live in Vermont. A lot of people love trees anyway. Here, <laughs> um, they're part of our livelihood in many cases. So um, you know, I this is just to say that that there are options for treating trees, as Danny mentioned, and I'll talk about that a little bit longer. But if there are high value specimen trees. Um, it's important to think about the benefits that those trees are providing um, in, in balance with understanding that EAB poses a risk. So, so there's, there is a weight there to think about. Um, that being said, municipalities do have a duty to ensure the public safety within the public right of way and on public property. And municipalities are going to bear the responsibility and the cost of that duty. Um, that last one's not fun. <laughs> I know that, um, you know, for Vermont towns already, like I mentioned, most, we have three municipalities in the entire state that have an arborist on staff. Three, that's it. So I know that trees um, generally are not really budgeted for. <laughs> um, oftentimes a tree budget is just removals or it's just bundled into public works or the road crews budget. Um, so this is, this is, I know, kind of a scary thing to think about for a lot of towns, but um, hopefully understanding the spectrum of options on the planning side and that there are different strategies and you can spread the costs out over time. Again, just this is the time to be thinking about that and planning should, should be starting now um, because being reactive might end up being the more costly option. Um, so that being said, when I'm talking about strategies for management, um, there, there really is this spectrum. So I'm, I'm going to talk about kind of the two far ends in the middle. Um, and, and we know that town by town in Vermont, there's not a prescripted, this is what you should do. 
it depends on so much. It depends on your, your staff capacity to care for trees, to cut trees down, um, staff capacity to plan, the public will and the public desire to be engaged in Emerald Ash Borer, um, how many first detectors you have in your town, um, if you have an active conservation commission, if you have a tree board, if you have a tree ordinance, if you have a tree policy, <laughs> if you um, have a budget, if you don't have a budget. Um, and the biggest thing is just understanding your vulnerability. So that's square one, is if you're a town like Barry City, if you're a municipality that only has 15 trees they're ultimately going to be dealing with on the public side, this is not going to be that big of a deal. But we have other towns that are just realizing, Randolph estimates 6,000 ash trees along their, their um, back roads. So that is going to be a bigger situation. So, so um, thinking about the management strategy on the spectrum and figuring out where your town is going to plop itself um, is a good way to think, of, think about this. Um, the, the, the ends that I'm going to talk about, the first one is this idea of, oh, and I just wanted to mention, so, so this is kind of along that spectrum. This is um, Burlington. This is one of those neighborhoods that is, it's about 250 green ash in one neighborhood, and every single tree within the green belt, which is the, between the sidewalk and the road, is a green ash tree. And so they are actually, this was a couple weeks ago, they had students from the Northlands Job Corps, which is in uh, Virgens, come and they're starting to do interplanting. They're not going to treat any of their trees. They're going to remove all of these ash trees, but they're going to do it over time. And they're, right now, their first step is to put in trees in between that are going to, so the aesthetic impact of the loss of those ash trees will not be so dramatic. Williston is also doing a similar thing. If you've ever been up to the Taft's Corner area in Williston, um, it is about 100% ash, green ash. Um, they have been preemptively removing um, and replacing ash trees for about three years now. What um, species are they replacing with? They, I think it's like five. <laughs> um, I know they're putting in like swamp white oaks. I think I've seen hackberries. Hackberries, yeah. maybe honey locusts. So not monoculture, but I wish it was a little bit more diverse. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're putting in other things. This is a demonstration of um, a trunk injection, systemic insecticide injection. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but this is a strategy that you either can be used to um, protect a tree for the duration of its life, or some towns have taken the approach, I don't know anyone in Vermont that's doing this yet, but in, in other states, of um, delaying the death of the tree. Just, so a temporary treatment again in areas that are highly um, populated with ash so that that impact is they're not all coming down at one time and then this is just um, an example of a rural road in uh, one of our staff went down to new hampshire the concord manchester area to do a tour last year after they've had it for a couple of years and just an example of these are all dead ash trees along a rural road and nothing's being done they're just and this house is for sale. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so just to give you an idea of the ends of that spectrum, um, on the on the far, you know, the the intensive planning side of things. If if you um, really want to think about, let's get all the costs out of the way now. So, if if you we're at the cusp right now, let's say you know what your vulnerability is to EAB. You have 150 ash trees on in your downtown and. Um, you just want to start preemptively removing them now. The cost burden is on the front end. You're not even letting the trees, um, you know, die in place. Like once they're infested, maybe they're, there's a plan right away to react and to take those trees down or to actually preemptively remove them. Um, and maybe you're treating some trees. So, so this, there's a lot of planning involved in this. You have to know what your resource is. Um, you're going to have to convince your select board or your, your um, citizens that um, this is a good strategy to go uh, that you just maybe your risk tolerance is low enough in town that you just don't want to be exposed to that that risk um, in the middle is this whole swath of options for more of a selective management and the the this this bucket of management style is really about spreading costs out <coughs> over time so how can you be strategic about understanding where your population densities of ash trees are, um, having a plan in place to be ready to respond once EAB is 
perhaps um, detected in town or once it is in you know, a five mile radius, um, knowing which trees you're gonna be treating, if any. Um, you might have some pretty uh, intense monitoring programs. So, so monitoring the population densities, so you know when you're kind of where you are on that population curve that I showed earlier. Um, and this SLAM is, is an acronym for Slowing Ash Tree Mortality. And this is um, Montpelier, if you want to see an example of this kind of in a plan, on our website, Montpelier has their Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan that they have presented to their city council. And SLAM is a part of that. And it's essentially one of the strategies is girdling ash trees um, to kind of sacrifice. So when the trees are weakened, EAB will flock to those trees first. So if you girdle a tree, stress it out, the idea is that all the EAB will go to that tree, then you cut that tree down, um, and so you kill them all when they're in their larval stage. So you're slowing ash mortality over time. So that's just one strategy. Yeah. Uh, I just read about that on your website. Um, uh, how, how many do you, if I have, let's say, 200 acres, yeah. with ash trees scattered throughout, but fairly dense enough that you could walk along and just pick them out regularly. Mm -hmm. How many trap trees do you need or should you create? And how long, how long does it take? I guess it depends yeah. on how close I, other I, I ash was told trees one, one per year. One per year? One per year. In, it, it, well, maybe not 200 how, acres, how, but I guess on my 40 what would one acres. tree cover? Like, yeah, I don't, I, do you know? I'm I don't gonna, know. We, we they're they're attracted from a long way away. So okay. they will hit the trap tree if they're within a mile or, or so. Okay. We use trap trees um, outside the infested area to, as a monitoring technique as, as well. So if we're trying to find if EBs in the area, we'll, we'll make trap trees because so, it's attractive. Uh, but there is a paper on this, so we can make sure you, you get the information yeah. on this. This kind of falls outside of the more of, um, <laughs> private land stewardship, but we should know it. Yeah, we should know it. Okay, so we'll, we'll, I will, we'll send you that paper. Um, so anyway, so the selective management is, again, it's all about spreading that cost burden out over time. So maybe you are preemptively moving, removing some dead or in poor condition trees now, but you're just prepared. You have, maybe you... Um, are uh, getting some funding set aside. So Middlebury is an example of a town. Their select board um, has been putting $5,000 aside um, in a EAB bank, essentially, that they're not using right now because they're not going to do preemptive removals. But that money will be ready and available when they get to a point where they're ready to take those trees down. And then, the th yeah. Uh, so if you've seen those purple traps. Yeah around your town then you know that no that the so that's an APHIS program so that's oh, part of the federal quarantine is that monitoring um, if it's deregulated I, I'm assuming they, they will may no not longer do that, do that. right I, I will say you can actually buy traps um, there's a company uh, bioforest technologies up in in Canada um, they do treatment they do insecticide treatment but they also sell green traps which I guess the green and the purple are kind of interchangeable. Um, so if you want to monitor, like the city of Burlington this year bought 40 traps of their own and put them up and we're monitoring on a bi-weekly basis. So um, that is, that is again, if you want to be doing that kind of more um, in-depth monitoring, understanding your own population levels at the local level. Now, and it's, it's my understanding though that these traps, which I've seen the purple ones even, is probably eight years ago I would see them sometimes yeah, on the yeah. back roads, you know, on, mm -hmm. in ash trees. But it's my understanding that those are uh, used as a monitoring tool. Mm -hmm. They're not used to catch no, them no, to no, try no. to yes, save them. It's sorry. strictly a, mo a monitoring, strictly monitoring tool. So it, it, it's it, not population control. Yeah, it's, it's just, just for your own thing to monitor. But if you're seeing, you know, one every month versus you know, in this area, we're, we're finding 25 every week that you, you can understand yeah. the population levels relative. So then on the far end of the spectrum, that management spectrum, is this reactive management, which is just the, we'll wait until they die and we'll deal with them as they die. You have no control in this management strategy, um, and you likely are going to be, deal if, you, if you have a high number of ash trees, you're likely going to be dealing with a high number of tree deaths at in a very short time frame, um, and we'll have to be dealing with those. So 
this, this ultimately, like I said, can be the most expensive management approach. And uh, compounded on that is that we know from experiences of other states that if, you're, if you are contracting tree removals to a major tree care, like a national tree care company, these companies have been dealing with EAB in the Midwest. They know um, that these ash trees fall apart and that they're more dangerous to work in. So they often will say, we will not climb the tree if, if um, more than 40 to 50 percent of the canopy is, is dead which means they have to bring in a bucket truck, which is a more expensive tree removal. Um, they also may say we will not climb any ash tree in, if the leaves are not on. So that means that any tree removal in over the winter months would require a bucket truck. Also, if you are in an area that has a lot of towns with a lot of ash trees and they're all taking this approach, the competition for those few tree care companies may skyrocket all at one time, which means they can potentially charge more for their services. So it's just important to re recognize that in lieu of a plan, if you have no plan, it could end up costing your town more. Um, yeah, that's all I said. Um, yeah. I saw wires in one of those previous photos. Um, yeah, I'll talk about utilities. Is that what your question was? Okay, I have two slides on utilities. <laughs> okay. um, so um, along with that, if, if you don't have an ash tree inventory, you can't do any planning whatsoever. So it just it's really important to, 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 if you don't have a plan, this is the time to start planning. If you don't have an inventory, this is the time to start planning for an inventory. And a tree, ash tree inventory can look many different ways. Um, if your capacity, if you're one person in a town that you're one volunteer and you only want to dedicate 10 hours of your time over the next six months to doing, to understanding your vulnerability to EAB, you could do a sample of select roads um, that are you know, high traffic or just random selection of roads. Um, and you could do a dot tally of ash trees. So it doesn't have to be um, a full inventory of every single ash tree, though it could be, and a lot of towns are deciding to go that route so that they can better plan. Um, we have, our program has, on our website, we have a whole ash tree inventory page, and we essentially present three different tiers of ash inventory. One is that kind of a dot tally, and that could be done in a car or walking along roads, sample or full, and uh, we have a couple of sample sheets that you could print off and just go out and, and do, your, do your ash tree sample inventory. Our second tier is really designed for the rural roadside environment and we, it's new and it's, um, we collect data using an app on a smart device. And the app is free, you just need our login credentials or, so you could use your own iPad, iPhone, smart device or you can, we have 12 that we can loan out. So I'm right now doing a lot of trainings with town conservation commissions on how to use that tool um, and then loaning iPads to those groups for a month or two so they can, they can do the inventory. And that again is pretty flexible so you can just do a sample or you can do all of your rural roads. It's really um, tailored to your capacity and your goals. Is there an Android? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, they, it's an app that the it's an ArcGIS collector. So on that web page, um, it shows you the system requirements. So as long as your device has those meets those requirements, you can use any device. So I, I know Android it is available on Android. Um, and then our third tier is our kind of comprehensive street tree inventory. So this is if you have a town green, if you have your downtown villages. Um, this is where we're stopping at every tree, collecting a point. Um, you're collecting a lot of data on every single tree, so it's much more labor intensive, but you're getting a lot more information. Um, it's not really appropriate for the rural roadside environment, but just as an option. Um, and so this is just an example of on that, the rural roadside um, inventory. Um, this is in Corinth, they've been using it on their roads, and uh, the red trees are trees that they have flagged for removal, and then the green ones are ones that are, are not, but these are all ash trees. So they're essentially, they can hand this over to their um, public works or their roads foreman and say, next year, these are all the trees we're taking down. Um, and I can talk, we can talk at length about inventory. Um, 
we have a guide and we have some videos on our website about the, the tool that walks you through what it looks like. Um, I don't want to spend too much time in it because we're kind of got to chug along, but I will take your question. Yeah, I, it's not about inventory. I was just thinking that yeah. you, you said that the, uh, the tree, men, the tree guys from businesses mm. don't really like dealing with Emerald the ash borer. And I was <coughs> thinking, well, the uh, our town guys are less skilled at all that yeah we we um we actually put in a forest service grant this year that we're really hopeful that we'll get <coughs> to develop a game of logging type training for oh, road crews idea. um specifically on how to work with eab infected so you'll let us know when yes you know. absolutely and that would be a kind of moving county to county mm -hmm. um how to id ash how to take it down safely yeah so just focus on ash and, and road crews? Um, just a, a note on utilities. Um, they're everywhere. <laughs> and um, we had a meeting, we had a couple meetings with utilities and emergency management. And the utility companies are absolutely aware of Emerald Ash Borer. They all have, it's on their radar. They all have plans. They know it's going to be a, a major cost for them. Um, and they will be dealing with and managing the trees within the utility right of ways. So um, they, you know, GMP has 11,000 miles of road um, that they'll be dealing with. So they're obviously, they are not going to be working ahead of the pest. They won't, they are going to be chasing it, essentially. Yeah, they, they'd like to be preemptive if they can, because they're on a five-year cycle, mostly. And it costs them, estimate-wise, three times as much to remove a dead tree. And particularly because dead ash trees, they can't get contractors in that will climb them. Um, and so they will get there uh, on their timeline, too. So it's, yeah. they've been mentioning to us a lot of communities are calling them. Can you Don't come and remove them. these trees? <laughs> they are actively planning now, and they are working on getting the financial resources that they need as well. So it's, they have a big lift ahead of them. But, but that being said, when I talk to towns about doing roadside inventory, you don't need to inventory the trees under the power lines on the side of the road with the lines because the utility companies will be managing those trees. They will be removing those ash trees. So at any given road, you're really thinking about one side of the road. Um, one thing that we didn't realize that may not be news to all of you, but for us urban forestry folks, uh, this idea of wood fairies, the people that follow the utility companies um, around when they're doing tree cutting and take the wood. So this is a way that EAB might be spreading. <laughs> um, so just, you know, there's obviously we're not going to enforce, no one's going to be a wood fairy policeman. Um, but Can just, you leave a note? Well, just, <laughs> yeah. Well, encourage just signage. Encouraging signage. Yeah. This, is, this, is a, this is on the public outreach piece at the local level, um, making sure people are aware of, of the danger of moving the pest around. What about state highways? The state, AMT. Yes, we are, we've uh, been meeting with AMT as well, and they're actively planning. Um, they don't necessarily have a plan in place right now, but we'll be doing training for their district staff. And uh, I don't know if they'll be preemptively moving or not, but they're, they're actively in the early stages of planning as well. On the cusp. But the responsibility. Their is responsibility is theirs. The does or does not lie with the municipality. It lies with the state. With the state, for the state. Yes. Yeah. Um, budgeting, you know, we can talk about this for a really long time. Um, um, I am in the process, and I have been for a while, of finishing up a spreadsheet uh, that will be available on our website that gives rough estimates of what you should expect for pricing. Um, and this is something that we wanted to do because already we are hearing about um, uh, you know, we, we heard from the Midwest, people will come in and prey on the fear of particularly elderly residents. Um, and I thought, that's not gonna happen in Vermont. And just a couple weeks ago, there's a resident in Charlotte who was convinced to treat three trees on her property for EAB, was charged $1,400, and the trees were box elder. So, um, <laughs> so we are, you know, we're gonna have this information up, and it's based on conversations with local arborist companies and with my, 
our contacts in the municipalities that have city arborists. So we kind of have a, a general range of what you might expect. Um, we're also really recommending that towns have information on their website or at their town clerk office about reputable companies that people can reach out to if they want to hire someone to treat or take down trees. Um, you can, you, we, can, we can say hire a certified arborist, which is what we as a state program say. We can't necessarily buy for specific companies, but at the local level, you know, we, we know that our, there are towns, like Charlotte is a good example, they are hoping to get everybody in town that wants to treat a tree on private property together and reach out to one specific company to do a bulk order for treatment, which will bring the cost down, um, and that they all know that it's a, it's a reputable company. So um, that's a tangent. But cost-wise, this is really, really rough, and I, uh, you know, the Forest Service for removals of trees gives this number of about $18.33 per diameter inch. Uh, but in my conversations with folks, it, the range, depending on the size of the tree, where it is, um, anywhere from 100, and, and how many trees they're removing, if it's a bulk order or not, anywhere from 175 bucks to 3,500 per tree. Very big range there. Um, if you're gonna get the stump ground, which is not required, it's not a treatment thing, it's just if you wanna plant another tree there, that's another 125 to 250 per tree. Um, for replacements, you know, if you're planting a tree with volunteers, and you you know got it from a donated source. Maybe it's 100 bucks versus all the way up to 600 if you're getting a contracted replanting. And then the insecticide treatment. If you're hiring a a sort of a private company to do a trunk injection of one of the two chemicals that we're recommending, which you all have a flyer about it, and I can talk about it as well. The, the number that, that keeps coming up is it's going to be about $12 per diameter inch. So if, if you have a 10 inch ash tree, a systemic treatment of that tree will be 120, should be around $120 every other year. So if you think about that versus the cost to possibly remove that tree and replace it, it and the benefits of preserving that tree, it could end up being just as cost effective to keep the tree and treat it. Um, there is a cool tool called the EAB cost calculator that was developed by Purdue, Purdue University that allows you to put specific information about your ash trees, like your, you know, we have 25 that are this size and 300 that are this size, and then also specific cost estimates from local companies. You can call people, ask, um, and then how far, how long you want to spread your management costs out over time, and you press the run button and it charts out what your you know what your cost burden is going to be each year based on those options. Is there a link to that on, on Yes, the, on our team? website. Yep. And um, our website. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um vtinvasives.org. Our website is vtcommunityforestry.org. But you can get it. You can get, you can get to them basis. both. And I also I brought lots of swag. These have VT Community Forestry. It's a maple um, magnet. And then there's lots of VT Invasive stuff up here too, so if you don't want to write it down, just get some swag and then take it back. <laughs> and if you go to VT Invasive under Resources for Municipalities, it links right to us. Yeah. We, we basically match. Yes, we're, we're doing these, yeah. Okay. Now what about like this slide right here? I don't think that's in any of my handouts. No. Um, if we go on the website, can we show this to the people that control the budgets well, and stuff? Well, you know, I, what I'm going to try to do is before Thanksgiving, finish my spreadsheet which is going to be more extensive than this and kind of give a, a more explanation um, base. So that like, for example, this $3 um, cost estimate up here, to, to apply one of the two insecticides that we're recommending, um, you have to be a certified pesticide applicator in the state of Vermont under ornamental and shade tree. Um, but if you, if you have that, if someone on, on town staff has that credential, you can buy, you can purchase um, the, the insecticide direct, and if you have the equipment to the stem injections, um, you know, the city of Rutland is gonna be treating trees, despite what you might have read on the AP. Um, 
And, and they're estimating that it's going to cost them about $3 per diameter inch per tree because they are going to be doing that um, in-house. So, so that spreadsheet will have more information about all that. I mean, we've already, this is at the college, we've already yeah. been working at this. We already have some estimates yeah. from different uh, contractors and stuff. Okay. We're already, you know, quite a ways down on the, the list of this. As Great. far as the landscape trees yes. go, I'm not talking about the, the force around there and everything yep. like that, but it's just important that everybody who counts the, the bean counters and, and everyone is all realize yeah. that this is, and so it's easy if we have a handout or yep. something, we can refer to that. <laughs> Sure. Um, so they can, you know, get on board with the program too. All right, I'm adding you to my list. Things to do. Head out. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to just zip through the last couple slides. This is all um, other, kind of in the bucket of like other considerations. After, I mean, the thing about the budgeting too is, you know, you've got to think about when it's a good time to request funding from. When is the um, <laughs> right? But so maybe okay. Maybe a better way to say this is how how can you make this a good time to request funding? So um, getting that the public support, making sure people are are there to support the request, making sure you've done your homework and can pr can demonstrate your town's vulnerability. Um, and I think a lot of that is in getting the inventory, um, having some specific numbers, and then making some cost projections. Um, wood disposal and utilization, so what happens to the ash trees that come down? Are they just left on site? Are they all chipped? Are they taken to a disposal yard in town? Are they bucked up for firewood and given to low-income mm -hmm. residents? What happens to the wood? Um, there, there's a lot of examples we're from across the country of really cool projects of artists that, you know, use ash wood to, to make beautiful pieces of wood for, of art for, or furniture for libraries or, you know, public rec centers, etc. cetera, um, certainly, like, you know, requires some thought, <laughs> um, but, but there are, there are a lot of uh, resources out there, and we actually were just sent um, a template for an urban wood use um, toolkit that's going to be released, mm -hmm. not from our state, but from Michigan, I think. So there are lots of examples. Um, as far as the disposal site, we are working with um, the Vermont Composters Association, starting to work with them. They need carbon for um, composting and what is carbon. So um, that might be a great opportunity for collaboration um, on disposal of, of ash chips. Uh, and then the state will also be identifying. We're working with solid waste. Solid waste, yeah. To identify sites where wood can be dropped off and treated appropriately yeah so this is just you know on the radar for other information you can provide to people that might be taking trees down and don't want to just leave the wood on their property yeah could you just uh, are you able to address heat treating and whether that makes it a viable yeah commercial product? it's it's I think the the specs are on yeah it's, heat the, treated. It's, it's, it's considered a treatment so if it's treated it can leave the infested area so that's another option. That's another yes. option. Yeah. yeah. That's another option. You put it put it in kiln. Yeah. Um, you know, we also have like Montpelier is really interested in buying a portable sawmill um, and then having people come to a location and for them to mill up the wood and use it. So Because you think the pest is just underneath the just bark. Just under the bark. You know, so it's, if you debark it, uh, you rest of it's great. great. <laughs> Um, public policies, again, I'm not going to talk about this too much, um, but do you have a tree ordinance? Do you have a tree policy in town? Most towns do not, and so they default to the Vermont Tree Warden statutes. This is a document that, um, it's legislation that's very old. Um, we have put forth efforts to update um, unsuccessfully in the legislature, but I'm um, hopeful that we can, we can have um, an updated version of the statutes at some point, it's a very nonspecific um, policy. So um, they use terms that are not defined. So for example, um, in the tree warden statutes, it deems that a tree warden, um, you know, is the purview of the tree warden is trees in the residential area. What is that? Is that just downtown or is that any road that has a house on it? Is that a residential area? So we, you know, we work with towns to develop a tree ordinance or policy that's more specific, that is 
uh, based on their local, how they want to manage trees locally. Um, so it's just something to think about. Um, this, this control of infestations, according to the tree warden statutes, the tree warden may apply our measures of infestation control on public and private land to any trees, shrubs, or plants harboring um, a threatening insect or pest. So this, to me, the interpretation is that if a tree is infested with emerald ash borer on public or private land, the town tree warden may deem that tree that, that tree needs to come down to be removed. It does not state whether the town or the private property owner is responsible for mm -hmm. paying for that removal, which is just another piece that's not specified. That's one area I think is really important, is how you deal with hazard dead yeah. trees on private property that could affect the public way in places. Mm -hmm. Um, the example uh, ordinance that <clears throat> you might have on your website, is that specific to uh, Emerald Dash? No. No. Um, and I don't know any, I don't know of any town who, the, who, whose impetus for developing a policy ordinance was the pest. More, it's that towns want more, um, more control over the way that areas of town are defined or roles and responsibility of the tree warden. Um, we have probably 15 examples on our website of different towns. So just, you know, there might be more, um, they might be more specific than that regarding hazardous and infested trees. I, I can't think of any town on the top of my head that uh, has anything about Emerald Ashport in their policy. Um, it's important to think about private property. Um, residential and commercial uh, are, <coughs> what information is your town giving to residents? Um, whether it be recommended tree care companies or um, an option to participate in a revolving loan fund like Montpelier wants to do so that people that can't afford to have all their ash trees removed can, um, have some assistance from the city and pay that back over time. Um, and uh, just general outreach about signs and symptoms, making sure people know what an ash tree looks like so they can even figure out if they have any on their property. Um, so it's just, you know, we don't have any specific recommend. We have a homeowner's EAB guide that's, it's just a two pager that you guys have in your packet. This is something that we've printed off for towns, you know, if you want 50 color copies, we can print that off and send it to you. Or St. Johnsbury asked us for 2,700 copies, and they put a copy in every single tax bill this year. So, um, just some very basic general information. Do you have an ash tree? Make a decision about it. Here are your options. Um, and then I already talked about this, but just understanding that that ash failed differently. Um, they're very brittle because the the, the larvae. The beetle desiccates the tree, so it loses moisture very quickly. Um, does not handle loads very well, so people climbing the tree, it's pretty dangerous. And they die pretty quickly, again, within five, four to five years of being infested. Um, and, you know, we don't know what that's going to look like in Vermont. So with our ice loads, snow loads, our winter storms, um, we just don't know. Uh, we, we can look to other states for yeah, other experiences. Yeah, we heard um, from some utility companies that have come in after EAB that used to be 40% uh, you know, takedown, 60% cleanup. Now it's 20% takedown, 80% cleanup because they when shatter. They, they shatter when they oh, fail. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's so just, yeah, and that's another cost consideration. If, you know, if a company is coming in and it takes them 30 minutes to take the tree down but three hours to clean up all the splinters, um, you know, that might just be more costly. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff real quick, and then we're going to move to our activity. Sure, yeah, I won't take long. I think Elise and Danny did a good job of, of covering all the important stuff. Um, and so I'll just give you an update on what kind of what we've been doing um, to manage for EAB and prepare for it on the Green Mountain National Forest, even though it's a pretty different type of land ownership. Um, and I see a lot of familiar faces, so I know people are familiar with the forest, but for those who aren't, um, just generally, it's about 400,000 acres, federally owned forest land. Um, it goes from Massachusetts border up to roughly uh, uh, around the center of the state along the spine of the Green Mountains, um, up in the uh, Lincoln-Granville uh, area on the northern end. 
and it's a, about half of that area is, is actively managed, um, uh, vegetation management for, for timber and other objectives. The other half, roughly about 200,000 acres, is, is reserved for management. Some of that's will, congressionally designated wilderness areas, and then um, some of that is, is withdrawn for other reasons, special natural areas and, um, and uh, other, other emphasis, management emphasis type areas. So like a lot of landowners around the, in, in the region, we've been, you know, for years, for about 10 years or more, um, we've been looking at what EAB has done in other areas and trying to prepare for it um, and trying to learn from what other parts of the country have been going through. And, and, and we've been kind of evolving in that over time. And uh, one of the big things we've done is try to, well, we, we try to look at the forest and look at where we have ash, but it's, ash is particularly difficult because as one of the slides mentioned, it's only about you know, 5% of the forest and it, it tends to be scattered and in pockets. We don't have nice big stands of pure ash or, or regions of ash. It's kind of scattered around the entire state. It's in um, wetter soils, low-lying areas, uh, you know, richer, uh, more calcium-rich soils and nutrient-rich soils in bottomlands and, and lower slopes, con, uh, convex slopes and things. So what we end up with is just pockets and patches of ash. We have some stands that are fairly heavy to ash, but more often it's just a component in a lot of stands. So it's hard to go out and, and look for it and try to proactively manage it. But where we are doing management on that roughly 200,000 acres, we're, 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 we're looking for those ash heavy stands and we're trying to, to to get into those and one of the things we're trying to do is just reduce the stocking in the ash um, so that there's just less there's going to be less mortality and so that we can um, so that we can uh, capture some of the value I mean there's there's uh, there's tens of millions of dollars probably in that size and acreage and standing value in, in ash saw timber and so we don't want to if we've got trees that are high value that are at high risk um, and we know we're not going to be coming back into an area for 15 or 20 years to do management we're looking to to capture that value but we're not trying to liquidate the ash either we're trying to keep ash on the landscape we're leaving a lot of the the, the younger pole size and small saw timber trees the saplings we're leaving some of the larger trees that are have a high wildlife value for our snags potentially uh, develop into snags and cavity trees and things. So we're, we're trying to leave a component there. And then also there's such a large area that we're not going to get to. We're, we, we're really in no danger of liquidating ash or even making a real dent in the, in the overall ash on the landscape. But, um, so we're trying to capture the value where we can, but we're also trying to encourage regen or recruit new ash and regenerate ash in some of these stands. So we're using um, vegetation treatments and silvicultural treatments that would uh, promote ash regeneration, which um, where we have good stands of ash, we want to get young ash that, I think it was mentioned before, that it's, it's a one inch and greater that the, the insect will, will attack. So, which doesn't give it much to work with, but um, you know, your seedlings and your small trees are lower priority, lower value for the borer. And they'll go after larger trees and stress trees. Small, vigorous trees are, are lower on their priority list. So um, if we can establish some, we're, we're making the, the, the ash tree on the landscape more resilient by having more age classes and having young ash and small ash. And so it buys us a little bit of time, even if we have infestations in an area. We've got these younger trees that may not be infested right away or might be more more resilient. It also gives us more opportunities over time to to have lingering ash that might show some resistance to the EAB. So it just gives us more kind of hedges our bets to keep ash on the landscape. So we're, we use silvicultural treatments like uh, small gaps and uh, um, small group selection treatments where we have ash that because ash tends to be a, a, a kind of mid-tolerant tree where it's, uh, it's tolerant to some shade. It competes well in a partial light environment. So um, by having uh, these smallish gaps, it's kind of a partial shade type situation that favors ash on these sites. So um, we're doing that. We're also uh, 
in our in their timber contracts. So we, with the infestation in Stanford, that's really the first infestation that where the those five that five mile radius overlapped with national forest land. So it's now part of the land that's considered infested, although we haven't found the insect on or infested trees on the property yet, National Forest Service property, but we're um, since we know it's close now, we're, we're going to be looking harder there. We're a little bit fortunate that we've already planned several thousand acres of vegetation management in that area surrounding that, that found that infestation. So we're a little bit ahead of the game. We're in a better position to, to kind of go in there and do some of these types of vegetation treatments that I, that I mentioned. Um, and, but where we're, doing, where we're doing timber removal as part of those projects, we're we're incorporating the state slow to spread uh, recommendations into our contracts, um, which will be somewhat challenging to enforce, but they're in the contracts. It gives us something to work with. And for the most part, with uh, the, the timber industry, we've had pretty good, um, I think there's been pretty good compliance and, and willingness to work with, with, uh, with landowners and with the state and with the Forest Service in trying to, trying to slow the spread and, and not, not move infested material, potentially infested material out of those, out of those areas. Um, something that we'll work with down the road, we're, we'll be preserving some ash seed, again, just to he hedge our bets with the genetics. Um, and we'll be, uh, we will be looking for, for those lingering ash. We've done some, um, supported some uh, uh, crossbreeding studies for other trees or programs for other trees trying to uh, um, breed resistant individuals like for for chestnut, butternut, elm, um, beech. We're we're working on now, so we'll be look we'll be we'll be working on that over time if if we can find potentially disease resistant trees. Um, <coughs> yeah. So I mean, there's the other thing we'll we'll work with is is biocontrol once we have a. Once the, the insect populations get high enough, there's opportunities to introduce predators that have been identified. They've identified a, a few different um, natural predators from Asia where the, where the EAB is native um, that... Are we sure about this? <laughs> well, I mean, that's, all, that's a good question. That's always a, a valid question. Um, and I, the researchers who, who do that work spend a lot of time trying to Identify potential risks for for invasive uh, invasiveness in those in those insects. Um, Are there any areas that you know of in the United States where they've introduced this stuff yet already? Yeah. Or is they, they're still in the. They have. I, I mean, I don't know a, a yeah, great deal about where. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, they did in their nature. Sure. There's, I think, there's four parasitic wasps that they. Yeah. yeah. You I'm need it. about it, but I didn't couldn't find any information as yeah. to whether it actually been done. I know they're studying it, but I. I didn't realize it yeah, and they, they keep adding new ones because different parasitoids and predators attack in different <laughs> stages or are good at, like there's parasites that will actually uh, get them through the bark. Um, they'll attack the larvae through the bark and depending on the si thickness of the bark, the size of the tree, it's different, different insects that can handle that thickness bark or are good for those. So they. They're they're trying to develop a suite of, of predators and paras and and parasitoids that they can, but you, you, that's not really helpful until you, you already so it's kind of an they call it the aftermath forest once the EAB, the populations are have have boomed and you've had all this this mortality wave and, and most of the ash are gone, um, or ninety nine point nine percent or whatever however it's going to play out then, in that you have those high levels of those insects then you can get a buildup in the population of the biocontrol um, agents, and so then the, the hope is that over time they'll they'll manage that or, or keep that population in check, which then would you know hopefully give our our ash seedlings and saplings that we've been managing for and trying to establish to our through our silviculture a, a, a better chance. Um, but that's a little bit down the road because we're we're years away from having a. Um, in most areas, uh, a population level of EAB that, um, that, that would support those kind of introductions. So, that's, I mean, I've probably taken plenty of time, so. Will the Forest Service um, use trap trees at all? 
We've been using trap trees as a detection method a little bit, working with the state. Um, I don't think, just for the, the, the scale of, I mean, it would just be uh, prohibitive, cost prohibitive, and if you don't have the capacity to do it as a, as a way to keep numbers down, and I think Maybe in some areas we'll try that. You know, for example, where we have those contracts where we have a lot of value, we That's might what try I was to thinking. we might try to to you know, and, and where the population levels are low right mm -hmm. now, we hope that we'll maybe slow it down a little bit. Um, but I think once the insect populations get high, it's going to be a limited use anyway. Um, <laughs> sure. Sorry, we're, we're, we, we always underestimate how much fun it's going to take to get through this stuff. But um, just to wrap up on the presentation part before we get into the, the interaction part, um, I'm not going to talk too much about resources. I already mentioned these two websites, btcommunityforestry.org and BT Invasives. We manage both the websites. BT Invasives is where is kind of the one-stop shop for all invasive species. So that's where you definitely want to know to send people if they think they have EAB. There's a big button on the front page that says report it. Press the button, you say who you are, where you live, and upload a picture of what you think you're seeing, and that goes to all of our partners. So that email goes to everybody. So um, then somebody figures out who's the best person to field it, um, and they would come in. Yeah, and it's important to let people know, we're still looking, actively still looking, yeah. looking for the pest. So please encourage people to report it, because you mentioned there's a little egg now, like double egg. If we find those spots a little further out, it will bump out the infested area more. Um, and then I just want to mention we do have a grants program that we just announced last week. Um, it's, it's peanuts, <laughs> uh, $2,000 maximum, but they're, it's a great planning uh, pot for planning for emerald ash borer. So um, this is really, it's a pretty easy grant application um, and it's entirely focused on municipal emerald ash borer planning so you could use that as seed money to buy an iPad so you can do an inventory or you could hire an intern to do all your to do your inventory you could um, buy some traps to do monitoring you could hire someone to write your plan for you um, and you could also use that money to do um, restoration and replanting so uh, it's not a lot for tree planting, but it could be a great public education opportunity to say, hey, this tree is a replacement um, for an ash tree that will be killed by emerald ash borer. Um, but we, can, we are not funding removals or treatment. Um, we're not funding treatment because treatment is a long-term commitment. You can't just do it once. You have to do it every other year for the duration of the tree's life unless you're using it just as a stopgap. Um, and we really think that municipalities, if they're choosing to treat trees, they should make the commitment um, and have that budgeted long term. Um, sorry, this is wrong. It's already announced. And the applications are due in... The 31st of January. January 31st. You've got a good chunk of time. Um, and we're going to... I'm going to switch over to Danny okay. now because we have about half an hour left and we're going to do a, a modified, modified activity. activity. Uh, we... There's a lot to share, apparently, and there's a lot of good questions, and I feel like we still have more questions in the room that we were not able to get to today. Um, we had an activity where we wanted you to sort of begin to be thinking about what EAB planning looks like at, in your community, um, and Michael made these awesome maps that we're going to send you home with. We're going to change it up a little bit because I don't think we have enough time, but what on the... So we're going to send you home with some maps to be thinking about... Um, I mean, the goal is for your town to be like looking at this map. So, okay, what are my high risk areas? What are the areas that we need to be doing an inventory for? Just to be thinking about what your approach could be in your community. So you'll have those and you can work with, with them. But on the back, I'm going to hand you out this sheet. On the back, there's a couple questions that I want you to break out into small groups. Maybe three people get together. And first, I want you to think by yourself for maybe about five minutes. And I have four questions here for you. What is an aha that you learned today that you'll take back with you that you can share with others? Um, what's a question that you still have that we can come back and we can continue to have a dialogue and answer? What's a concern that you have that maybe we can be working on uh, that you didn't hear that we were addressing today? And what is maybe your next step that you can take back to your community? Uh, so the goal is to break out into groups of two or three, take five minutes by yourself and think through these questions, and have a dialogue about 10 minutes with whoever you're sitting with and then we'll share back so we can hear 
uh, what everybody's ahas were, what questions or concerns or next steps are as we move forward. This, this so is a, on the front of the sheet. Yeah, a, that could guide conversation. Yeah, on the front of the sheet, um, when we're going to have you sit down with maps, some of the questions that we were thinking about for you to assess what was happening in your community was, uh, what's the level of awareness that your community has? Have you already done an inventory? You have a plan? Not much. What's your town's capacity? Do you have staff that can help? Your votes group capacity? Local volunteers, professionals in the community. What are your public policies like? Do you know? Maybe you don't know. And what's your budget like? Uh, do you have any money for tree management now? Is it lumped in the road in the road budget? Just kind of be thinking about some of those major areas. Okay. Any questions? I, I'm going to make a wild suggestion here. Yes. Yeah. Go for it. Shelley actually did some of these tree inventories starting five years ago. Yeah. Okay. Share. And, well, we have reports, but I was just going to say that one thing the towns could do is have the conservation district apply for the grants and do the planning for you because you could combine your funds and get a lot further along than if you all do it things individually. Just a suggestion. No, that's something about. Do you want us to share anything, Shelley? Um, well, I. Because she did an inventory for Bennington, we helped do inventories for Manchester Village and. North Bankton. I mean, some of the stuff we've been thinking about, it's, I, I think at this point we have to start getting getting moving on this. So that's just a suggestion that there is an organization out there that can has capability. And we have access to volunteers that can help with the kinds of sampling surveys that Elise mentioned or put you in touch with other organizations that might be able to, to help in other ways. So um, we have some experience with this and We've been committed to it for, for a number of years, and I'd be glad to help you with any questions you have and to do you, some legwork for you. Could you give us your... I can leave my card out for you. Okay. That's that is a fantastic resource, which is it's phenomenal. And when working in the islands, they're thinking about creating an, uh, a Grand Isle task force, representations from each of the communities, because they feel like if they can share resources together, if they, uh, it's a great approach to work with your neighboring towns. Yeah, Shelley, um, we have a conservation commission that's very interested in doing an inventory, but I'm just thinking some kind of training or expertise from people that have already done them yeah, would be really valuable. Yeah. Do we prefer, I mean, this is your time, so maybe we prefer to just kind of ask questions and have more of a dialogue, or do you want to do the activity? What it, uh, I guess. No, I, I, this is it's a sort of picky, but your statement that you should inventory trees on one side of the road, another side, eh, I would not do that. People okay. should just inventory what they think is important. You can always throw stuff away. You can't go back and collect it again. Sp spending time in the field, I would, I would, I would, but that's a minor thing. And, you know, utilities are going to take care of it, but you can also take care of it as well. You know, and the utilities and they may they, not get to it. They may not get to it for a while. The big thing about utilities is that whoever's going out there needs to be certified to deal with electric hazards. So they have, there's a certain training that arborists have to have. You get 10 feet near that line and move trees. It's high risk. So you cannot send your road crews out there without having, it's really risky to take them out if you don't have this proper training. And I just, I just warn you, really, we've seen, we've done these trainings with road crews and we bring utility arborists in and they just share some horror stories. Yeah. I wonder, is, when you do an inventory, is it possible to just say within a utility right away or not within a utility yeah, right so, away? Yes, so I, do I, have I guess I should clarify, on our, on our roadside tool, um, there's a, a worksheet that I you know, encourage the towns to go through before they, uh, to establish their protocol. And there's an option, one of, the, one of the fields is tree ownership, so it's either public right of way, utility, or private. So um, that's, a, the, I guess, the conversation with the towns that I've inventory worked with so far, they've all decided not to do the utility because they have recognized they have limited capacity and a lot of miles of road, and so they're just going to be doing. But if you want to collect that data, there's an option for it. You can say, yes, it's in the utility right of way. And the, the Randolph example that had 6,000 trees, they did 10% of their roads, and then they were able to, as a sampling, and they were able to estimate. So there's, there's different, many different models and figure out what works best. The other way, the other thing that with our tool um, is that instead of being, you can either choose to take point data on every single tree 
or you could, there's a field that says count, so you could just say, we're gonna drive every quarter mile, gonna tally all the ash trees every quarter mile and plot a point every quarter mile and, the, and say how many ash trees were within that. So that's another, like you're doing less plot, 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 you're counting, 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 so it's quick, that could save time as well. So this tool is really meant to be flexible based on town's capacity. Where would we um, find the application? So the information is up on our website. Um, it's, uh, sorry, the BT Community Forestry website. Okay. <laughs> this one, um, and there's a whole page under resources inventory, ash tree inventories. Um, and, and grants, you'll see yeah, under financial. Under grants. It's, under there too. it's on the home page. Yeah. Or you just email us, we'll make sure you get whatever you need. <laughs> Elise is one of the main things she's doing right now also is providing technical assistance. So even providing, if Shelly had any questions, if she's working one on one with you, we'd be there to support. Yeah. I had a question. Um, I've done a lot of research on the uh, treatment options, yep. you yeah. know, and, and whatnot, and talked with certain uh, people that are arborists that, are, that, that do these. And I've had a very hard time finding, an, you know, just a third-party source that's told me how effective these programs are and what the success rate okay. is. Do you have any yeah, there's, it's experience a great, about this? Or? Well, there's a great paper out of Purdue University that talks about different chemical t options and also the, there's a whole frequently asked questions and side effects of the pesticides. So we didn't get into the chemicals, but what we have are recommending is uh, systemic insecticides that's called the emamectin benzoate which you put it into a trunk injection mm -hmm. and, it, and it goes up uh, through the tree um, and we like this one because it's effective it lasts about two years and it doesn't have um, as much um, collateral damage I it's probably how effective is it do you know I mean it's it very effective is it 90 percent uh, no I think it's up in the nine I mean they're they're saying it will manage it and if I go on Purdue's website I can we have it on our site as well. I it's just, on your I think website. Progress is taken down. I don't know if it's no, we have the frequently asked questions. Yeah, the frequently asked questions. Frequently asked questions sorry, after that. And that will list like the pre the approximate success rate or whatnot. Yep. So I can yep. use Because yeah. there's another one that's a neem byproduct that's not as effective. Which is also that that's one of the two products that we're recommending are the two are the non neonicotinoid. It's like, so the non-pollinator impacting, there are lots of other options out there, but those are the two that the state are recommending. So the emamectin benzoate, the other one is zataractin, which is a byproduct of neem. Um, uh, homeowner, you could go to Amazon.com and buy an EAB insecticide as a bark spray, as a leaf soil foliar, drench. a soil drench. Those, um, we feel uh, we're not recommending those, just they are... Um, they have more unique. persistent impacts on the environment and um, also if somebody's buying a product um, and they're not a certified pesticide applicator the dosage is really important um, so we're really recommending those two products and having a certified applicator do the um, do the application um, and it's for we're ever recommending it high value trees you know really healthy trees and high value locations because it is a long-term commitment um, but it there's we've driving by some trees today in yeah. Rutland that's just like ah you know it's just they're beautiful they're just beautiful, they're beautiful trees yeah. and does it matter what time of year you do that yes yeah. spring yeah, yeah spring you do it want to do it when yeah. they're, when they're, they're moving, moving up and yeah because yeah. it, it it's a trunk injection so it's essentially you have to wait for the whole the chemical to like so that's what you're paying for really is someone to sit there make sure the dose is right but they have to like let it move through the tree so the, uh, it's a lot of like waiting <laughs> um, and also the the last thing on anamectin benzoate is that it actually persists in the leaves so it kills both the larval stage and the adult that's feeding on the leaves and the, the document we were mentioning from Purdue that talks about the frequently asked questions we'll talk about what it does to uh, woodpeckers that are eating the larva and, and the, um, the impacts to the environment which from their research is very low, but you want to read it so you're well informed about if you're applying a pesticide, you understand the impacts that it is having. Um, we don't have as much time as we had hoped. We This is our first time doing this. We realized we have a lot to share. We have probably a lot more to share. Uh, so let's just, I'm just, I think we'll just stay together. <laughs> and uh, any concerns that maybe you heard or things that you feel like go back and follow up on? We heard the one about the uh, utilities. 
I mean, it's, it is a good point that if you're, get, if you're only going to get out to each road once, why not just have a full understanding? But I think each town can decide whether or not they, you know, they want to spend that extra time inventorying trees that they want and, to manage. And this would be town roads only, These, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. As opposed to state highways. Yeah, right. They are managed yes. there. Yes. Yes. Forest service roads. Mm -hmm. I yes. live in Woodford, and they, there's like two roads. Yeah. yeah. Two, <laughs> two town roads. Well, <laughs> so you're going to help other towns? Come <laughs> <laughs> down and come to town. Well, I don't Lots know. <laughs> and you know what we didn't talk about is recreation trails. We have town forests. That's another thing that, you know, I don't expect you to probably, you want to monitor, you know, uh, risk trees along trails. And if you are doing any work in there, you may want to think about that. But this, just this other things to be thinking. I, I live in Stone. We have a wreck path that is loaded with ash trees. Jock has a good point. There's a lot of private roads. Yes. And is anybody thinking about how that's going to be addressed? Yes. Because they have very complicated ownership or lack thereof. And like some with no agreements. Well, it's true. Uh, that's we've been trying to communicate out. To, there's another program, the County Forester Program, that works with private landowners, and I think they're so. That's a, I think that's probably a gap that we should really take back. And just, uh, you know, another thing that we've been talking about doing, like this, was mostly focused on how the municipalities manage and what their approach could be. It doesn't mean we can't come back in, in your municipality and do something that you bring your residents to and we share information. That could be a strategy that you say, we got to inform our residents because they have a lot to manage and they want to manage the risk. Well, there was a very good one that... Mobile home parks because of the risk to the towns. Yes. That's a good way down. Yep. And this is... um. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. mobile home park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where an owner who may not have resources and tenants who don't have resources and risk to the homes, etc. And that's what you know. You look at your map. Plus you density. Can, plus. Yeah. You can identify maybe. I mean, it probably doesn't have all the, the pieces, but you start to identify maybe in your community. Oh, we have an area that we need to get out to because we can kind of. You know, we're coming at a state level, but I, I'm not going to know, we're not going to be able to provide that kind of resources at the local level. So that is something to kind of hone in on, is how do you help your residents prepare for EAB? Because there will, there will be dead trees around, and they're going to be risks associated with it. And you don't want them being taken for uh, advantage of by spending money to treat maple trees. And, but in, in rural Vermont, most, there's a lot of people who are heating yeah, yeah. A, that's the thing. We have I was moving a bunch of ash firewood this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, Not very far. No, <laughs> fifty <laughs> feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From the pile into the woodshed. <laughs> I'd love to hear more of these concern areas because you know this. We expect we're going to be doing this for a while. So yeah. the more you share with us now, we don't know Vermont's story yet, right? This is we're just at the beginning, and uh, we're trying to address. Well, it's not written yet. It's not written yet. It's not. Right. We were saying, because we've been talking to utilities, like, I don't know what you're dealing with. I can only tell you what we've heard from other states, and it's, and it's, it's, it's different as it moves forward. So, I don't know. I'll mention a concern that I have is um, where I live, and even on my property uh, in, in the town of Sandgate, there's a, there's a large ash dieback currently happening yeah. right now from ash yellow. Right. And yeah. you can drive down any road in Sandgate and see dead ash. Right. right. That's Nothing's true. happening right now. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a concern of mine that nothing's happening right now when this is, you know, we already have a situation in certain spots. Um, so maybe... This is going to really be. Um, if towns aren't awake yeah. already. Right, right. And that's it, you know, one of the things that, you know, sometimes these emergencies help us prepare for the future, right? So maybe it's an opportunity to, if you don't have an active tree warden, and we have several here today that you, you have an active tree warden, you get uh, your road crews trained to be able to move remove trees safely, you get your policies in order. So it's an opportunity to think forward and be and be prepared uh, planting a diversity of species if you if you're in a planting program um, getting citizens involved you know, there's a whole range of options what's what's been the public response or backlash about the 
the injection just because everyone well the all... sentiment's different uh we thought everyone was going to be no pesticides in yeah. vermont and we're not finding that as much because uh there's people that really care about some of their ash trees and they want to protect them and that's yeah. we're finding so we want to just make sure that we're giving them the information to make informed decisions well that's just said i mean you're putting on it I, yeah I, I think informed. you know from sit like burlington's not treating any trees um Rutland's treating as many as they can. Um, Montpelier will be treating. 15. There's downtown, the trees, the, the high value. It really is, I, it's, I think we're being, I'm surprised that Burlington decided not to treat any. Um, their rationale is, makes sense to me, is that they feel like if they choose one neighborhood over another to treat, they can't, they have 1,200 trees, so they can't treat all of them. So they don't feel like they can discriminate and say, we value this neighborhood more than we value this neighborhood. Um, they have, you know, the ash heavy neighborhoods, they've talked to the residents um, and, you know, there are examples in other states where, um, you know, residents might buy in to treat the tree in front of their house. Um, and that hasn't been, I think, the idea of these neighborhoods planted with monocultures, people are like, no, we don't want a monoculture anymore. <laughs> Let's like, diversify, and this is the time to do it. And private companies, I know they've been busy. Um, they have been busy. Busy. And so the recommendation of when to treat is if you're in the infested zone or near it, like a couple miles outside of it, is they, they say about 12 miles from an infested area about when it's time to start treating your trees. So... Even in Charlotte, where we know that one example, that's not even, it's early, really it's early. It's, they, Charlotte. Shouldn't even be, they, don't, they don't need to be treating it based on what we know about where the infestation is. So it's, it's a management option when it's closer. Question? Oh, all right. <laughs> no, sorry. It's not a big question. I was just wondering, like, do, do uh, ash trees have um, flowers or at some point that the bees go to? Is that why? We're concerned about neonics. Yeah, so the, we're concerned about the use of neonics because you're applying them mostly for homeowners would be bark spray or soil drench, which will then get to Goes other species. Okay. Uh, if they are, they do have flowers. Uh, the wind pollinated plants early in the the spring, uh, so you not tendency for bees to be okay. as a pollinator for ash trees. And ash are dioecious, meaning that there are female trees and male trees. Oh. So, my, um, the, my consulting forester has recommended that I look for the flowers and mark the female trees to leave as a source of seed for. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, again, the management's really different in woodlands and wanting to keep the next generation because I think we have hope that eventually maybe there'll be this balance that comes around where EAB and our ash populations, like they do in Asia, sort of survive together. But the way we're going to see the wave march through.